I would like to introduce today's speaker, who is Doc Dr. Jeffrey Blakely of the University of Wisconsin. And Jeff has been coming to the PEF for almost as long as I have been alive, which is just too long. You don't want to stress it. Years or so. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> And his work has been centered on this site, Tel El Hesi, um, which is a large uh, site in uh, southern Israel, which was also the first site that we, the PEF, excavated um, in the 1890s. So it's a site which is very important to us at the PEF and important to Jeff because this is where he spent most of his adult life, basically. And so without further ado, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Felicity. Um, it's always nice to be here. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a frequent visitor. Uh, and before I move on to the next slide, I, I want to say that this is just one of my favorite archaeological pictures of all time because it shows the work at the site of Tel El Hesse and then lined up there, which you can barely see, are all the workers who did the work. And I think it's a truly wonderful uh, image. <coughs> the American archaeologists went to the site of Tel El Hesse in 1970 which had been dug uh, 80 years earlier uh, by the PEF. And one, it, it was immediately clear that for us to understand the site, we needed to understand the older work. And for the people involved here at the PEF, they needed to understand our work to put it all in context. And as it happened, one person here at the PEF, John Mathers, uh, decided he would come and dig with us. And in fact, his master's thesis is on Tel El Hesse. And so in 1973, I worked for him. Uh, and he was there just for a couple years. Uh, and then he went on and did some other work, but he died far too young. Uh, but he was a truly wonderful gentleman. But he was quite clear. If you're going to understand the site, you must become a subscriber. And you must visit often. And I have done this, and so now for, this is the 50th year that I've been a subscriber, and uh, frequently I write Felicity and say, can you get me this and this? And, and she says, yes, yes, and like that, it's there. Uh, but then Felicity knew I was coming through right now, and if Felicity asked for me to give a lecture, yes, I'm going to do the lecture. So uh, th th there we are. Um, okay. This, well, from the Crusades until about 1800, there were over a thousand pilgrim accounts that are, are relatively well known or published uh, describing the Holy Land. About 100 of these, the pilgrim goes past the region I'm talking about. And this is an image from the most famous of the groups of pilgrims. This was Felix Fabry and Bernard von Breitenbach in 1483. And here, here they are showing an image of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, they didn't show any image of Hesse uh, because it wasn't really that important to them. But that's when Hesse really is entering scholarship. And, and subsequent travelers describe you know, various aspects uh, of the region. And, and these accounts kept growing and growing and growing. And so by the time you get to the early 19th century, as I said, you have about 100 that are describing our area. And it's at that point that an American biblical scholar, Edward Robinson, who was highly learned, he had been trained in Germany, but he was an American, um, he was asked to write a uh, biblical commentary. He had never been to the Holy Land, but he knew all the literature. He knew all the travel accounts, he knew the Greek and Latin and Hebrew and Aramaic and, and you name it, and he knew it. And so he decided that he wanted to go and see the land so that he could write a, a, a understanding of the Bible that was informed. And so in 1838, he went. And this is the map uh, that he created. Now, he is viewed by many as the founder of the discipline because he is the person who recognized that if you look at the then modern Arabic place names, 
that you would see, you, you could see the old Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and Aramaic <coughs> names of biblical sites. And as he traveled, he recorded every biblical or every site he could think of, every name he, you know, he, he found. And he created the first historical map of, of, the, uh, of the biblical period based on uh, this understanding. And so at one point, you know, he goes and visits Gaza. And, and then over here is the site of Tel El Hesse. And this is the, the, the point where, in terms of modern scholarship, uh, Tel El Hesse and the Hesse region is literally put on the map, and, and it becomes a focal point of archaeological and historical research. His work was, was recognized as revolutionary, and for about the next 50 years, many scholars and travelers and other people augmented his work by doing specialized studies in either part of or large parts of the Holy Land, coming up with more and more names and coming up with more biblical identifications. And the PEF was founded in part, I think, because of this tradition. And they did survey work where they were recording uh, sites in Philistia, sites up near uh, Nablus, uh, sites now, you know, in, in the uh, Sinai, Jerusalem, and, and they were also doing excavation uh, in, in Jerusalem in some very uh, early and pioneering work. One of the most significant pieces of scholarship they did was the survey of Western Palestine, which uh, they published in 1880. Uh, the work had been done in the 1870s by uh, ultimately Lord Kitchener and, and Claude Condor. Uh, and, and they and royal engineers working with the PEF mapped the entire region of Palestine at a scale of one inch to the mile. And, I'm, and somewhere hidden away are these maps. Uh, and they're truly wonderful to see in the original one inch size. They, they tend to find them in a reduced size now. But here is their sheet 20, which is, again, the Tel El Hesse region. And, and so I wanted to point out Tel El Hesse itself is right here. Gaza is over about where I am. And then there's a site called Um Lakis, uh, which is right here. And this site is important uh, because after the... Uh, explorations in Jerusalem where the PEF found digging in a modern city complicated. One of the uh, board members, trustees of the PEF was Archibald Henry Sace. And he was an incredibly well-known scholar of his time. He was both an Assyriologist and a biblical scholar. And when the PEF was looking for what do we do after we finish this survey, there was one group that said, well, you did it at a one inch to the mile, let's go back and do four inches to the mile and you know, do the whole country all over again at greater detail, find more sites. He said, no, we need to go and dig. We know you need to go and dig a biblical site that's not covered by a city because then you've eliminated many, many problems. And he argued that they wanted to visit and excavate biblical Lachish. And Um Lachis, Lachis, Lachish, they thought they saw an equivalence in the name. And at one level, they thought Um Lachis might be my mother was Lachish, and therefore Lachish would be in the area. That turned out to be wrong, but you know, that's not terribly important. They thought it was right, therefore they go down to this area. And the other point that Sace made, because he could read cuneiform, he said, what you will probably find are cuneiform tablets dating to the biblical time period, and you will find accounts and descriptions of daily life in Old Testament times, and what could be better for understanding the Bible. And that argumentation carried the day, and they decided to go down there. They got a uh, permission uh, from the the government, the Ottoman Empire, to excavate this region. And they said, ah, but we need an archaeologist. 
And so they looked around and undoubtedly the most famous archeologist of that part of the world at the time was William Matthew Flinders Petrie. And he worked in Egypt. He was a, he's one of the founders of Egyptology and they convinced him in the year 1890 to come up and to dig for the society. Uh, and he did. Uh, there were a, a few pop problems with the permit, uh, but once that got sorted out, he was able to go down to the area for about six weeks and, and do the first real excavation. So he started at Umlakis, and this is a cattywampus thing that we made. It's oriented this way because I put north on <coughs> top. <laughs> but this is Umlakis right here. And this is what many people thought was biblical Lachish. So he starts excavating there for one week. And he finds that it is a Byzantine site. It was founded in the late Byzantine period. And that there's a lot of Islamic and Crusader materials on the site. So, oops, this isn't Lachish. But since Um Lachish might mean my mother was Lachish, maybe it's in the area. And so... He was looking around in the area where they had the uh, excavation permit. And he was drawn to this site. This is the site of Tel El Hesse, as it looked at the very, very, very beginnings of Petrie's excavation. And so for that first week, while his team is excavating Umlakis and learning how to dig in this part of the world, Petrie is here. And what he's doing is he's wandering up and down this 120-foot cliff that was eroded by the stream. And he is looking at the pottery and walls that he sees sticking out. And here is the only quote you have to read. Uh, this is from his successor, Bliss, who says, pocket knife in hand, he climbed the steep slope and... During the course of the, a, a section of the artificial mound had been practically laid bare. The story of the site was suggested and outlined by fragments of pottery of various ages, some strewing the surface, others disla uh, dislodged from the site, as well as by the in indications of strong walls of mud brick, not easily to be distinguished by the ordinary observer from the natural unworked soil. And let me say that's very true for this region. There are very few stone walls at this site. Uh, but clear enough to Petrie's eyes, and clearer still after a little scraping with his pocket knife. And so Petrie is going up and down this site. And as I say, he's an Egyptologist. At the very top here, he was finding pottery like this. And this is one of the shirts he found. This is from Athens. This is an attic uh, red figure uh, shirt that was made about the year 450. And so this is near the top of the site. And so the and inference is that that would be about when the site was abandoned. And, and he knows he can date it because there's been work in Athens. Uh, and even in 1890, the chronology was not bad for Athens. In the middle of the site, he found vessel or found a vessel, numerous pieces of uh, pottery that looked like this. This is from Cyprus. It's called a Cypriot base ringware of Bilbil. And he knew that these dated to about 1300 BC. And he knew this because these had been found in tombs in Egypt that he had excavated. And he could date by the context in Egypt. So at the top, you're about 450. Here in the middle, you're about 1300 BC. And then at the very bottom, of there's 60 feet of occupation, there's 60 feet of a sand dune. So, um, so at the very bottom of the ex occupation, just above the sand dune, he finds pottery like this. He's never seen anything like this in his life. He doesn't know what it is. And his best guess at dating was to say, well, he knew how far it was from the 450 sand shirts to the 1300 shirts. So he did a calculation of centuries per feet or feet for centuries, take your pick which way you want to go. And based on that mathematical calculation, he figured that this must be about 1700 BC. 
Now, he was wrong on that, but you can't blame him. He had no other way of dating the site. Um, he, he was only a thousand years off, and in large part, that's because the site was abandoned for a thousand years. Uh, so, he, he, so he founded for Palestine region pottery chronology, and he correlated other vessel types that change as you went up and down uh, you know, in the site. And so here are some of his publications. And you know, Jewish and Greek pottery, we would call this Iron Age and a few Persian period shirts down here. And he laid out pots. And, and uh, I, I know Jonathan and maybe some of the others of you can look at these, and they know precisely what you're looking at, even in these drawings before they're standardized the way we would do them. And he was also looking at the flints and trying to do uh, the, same, the same process. This was revolutionary. Now you could go to archaeological sites and you could more or less date them anywhere uh, in, in Palestine. And, and this would be incredibly useful if you're trying to do a geogra historical geography uh, of the region. So that's what Petrie did for five weeks. He did not like Palestine at the time. And he, at the end of his contract, he went rushing back to Egypt, hoping never to return, although later on he did after World War I, uh, you know, back, back to Egyptology. And so here is his drawing uh, of the site showing the various walls and showing a layer of ashes and then uh, blow-ups uh, of some of these walls. But notice he shows really no floors, just, just walls, the mud bricks sticking out. And he in, published almost immediately, and the PEF published this uh, fine report. By today's standards, it's a bit short, but hey, you know, times move on. Well, the PEF, this is wonderful. We have found Lachish. It must be full of tablets. We just need somebody to go and dig it. So they hired the son of the founder of American University of Beirut, or Syrian Protestant College, Frederick Jones Bliss, who was fluent in Arabic. In fact, you might even say Arabic was his first language, and English uh, what was his second language. So he could communicate with all the locals. Um, Bliss had nothing better to do with his time. And so the PEF hired him to go and dig the site. Uh, he knew nothing about archaeology. So they sent him to Egypt, and he spent a few weeks with Petrie, and he learned everything there was to know about archaeology. Now, personally, I wish it had been that simple for me. It took me just you know, a little bit longer to learn archaeology. But he learned it in a few weeks. And he goes up to the site, and comes back to Hesse in 1891 and 1892. And <coughs> most of his work is digging what we affectionately call Bliss's Cut, which is 60 feet down and about 120 feet pie-shaped excavation. That is, for the mathematically inclined, 750,000 cubic feet of soil that they excavated. Um, and, and here is a nice photograph partway through it um, of his methods uh, and the workers working. Right near the start of this excavation, this is what he called City 7, and he found eight cities and three sub-cities. So this is very near the top. This is the layer where you would find most of the added pottery. And he has people digging over here. And one of them says, here's all this black seeds. Well, they were barley seeds. And so Bliss said, dig them carefully and follow them. And so they found a floor, and then they found the walls, and then they went around through the doorways and other things, and they laid bare this part of the project. So in doing that, he learned how to dig to find floors, how to dig to find walls. And he recognized that this is how you should do archaeology. You separate out the various layers by floors, and then you separate the pottery in each layer 
as Petrie had showed him on, on ceramic chronology, and you can date the layer, and you can show the layer. This is the foundation of the archaeology that we do today. We do nothing different than what they were doing. Now, are we a bit more refined? Yes. Uh, do we record it more carefully? Do we have many other things to help us? Yes, but theoretically we are doing precisely the same thing now. So this is where the discipline began, uh, and we still are following through today. So uh, Bliss then used that method. He would dig down to one set of floors, he'd clear off, he'd map, <sighs> then he would plomp out or, you know, the, the walls, and he would go down until he found the next set of floors, he would clear off, you know, save all the stuff between them, down, down, down. And as I said, he found eight different cities, as he called them, or uh, plus uh, three subcities. And again, in wonderful fashion, Bliss published his work almost immediately, A Mound of Many Cities, that recognizes his discovery of stratigraphy. Uh, and and it, it's a truly wonderful I think, a truly wonderful book to uh, read because it's, it's real discovery of the discipline, but it's also done by a person who is very attuned to the native population who was excavating for him. He is learning from them uh, in many senses, as well as them learning a little bit from him. So, Bliss reaches the bottom of the site in 18, December of 1892. That's the end of the permit. He goes back and writes up the report, and the site is then sits there for 80 years. Discipline grows dramatically with work by, uh, at Megiddo, Beichan, uh, names like uh, PLO Guy, McAllister, Dane Kenyon, and Crowfoot. The discipline gets better. Parallels are found at the, you know, to these things. Uh, and in the 1960s, the American archaeologist George Ernest Wright is at Harvard. Well, first he's in Chicago, but then he's at Harvard. And he's president of the American Schools of Oriental Research. And he says, you know, we need to look and see how much our discipline has grown in these 80 years. So what we need to do is go back to one of the pioneering sites we need to dig it with the best methods of today, in other words, 1970, and compare. He didn't really want to do the work. He, he, he was in ill health. And so he organized the project from his students and colleagues. And then from 1970 until 1983, eight seasons of summer excavation occurred at Tel El Hesse. So this is what it looked like in 1971. Again, you can see Bliss's cut. You can see where we, the excavators, lived. We, ex we lived on the site. Um, and where we, ex you know, and, and we excavated. So we excavated up here, immediately adjacent to Bliss's cut, so we could compare. And we excavated elsewhere on the site. We are about 110 people there. This is 1971, which was my first season. There are a few Palestinian laborers who had been trained by Dane Kenyon and were very good at excavations, and they taught us how to dig. But most of the work was done by these American college students and others who took this for credit as part of their college or university education. That's the tradition I come from, and I am in that picture. Um, here is the site of Tel El Hesse. Up here is Bliss's cut. Here's another area he excavated. He also did some trenches hither and yon. So here are the we, where we dug next to where he had dug, but then we also dug down here. If you're looking at the site from a distance, it's this little mound right here that you see, which is just a few acres. But in reality, the site is 25 acres. There is a lower city, there is an upper city, and uh, we, we chose to dig uh, both. 
Um, ah, backwards. Uh, so, as I said, this was eight seasons from 1970 to 1983. Besides digging, we had a geologist with us. And he said that it's important to put HESI into its geological context. So he organized our, sur our survey for the region. And so he spent from 1970 to 1983 wandering about, dating the landscape and finding sites so that we could understand how Hesse fit in. He was a geologist. He recorded where he found things that were useful. He did not record where he had looked. <laughs> you see the problem, I think. So when it fell to me to publish this, I couldn't publish it as an archaeological survey because I had no idea where he had looked. So from 2004 to 2008, we had to redo the survey. Now, we knew where the most important sites were, but we had to look every place else. And so here we are. We find about 800 sites in an area that's 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, or 100 square kilometers, or about 40 square miles. Now, probably 3 quarters of these sites are shared scatters that date from the Crusades to the modern period. They're Bedouin campsites. Now, many people would not have recorded these because there's no structure, and it's late non-biblical stuff, and who really cares? Well, we cared, and, and, and we recorded it. So we found sites all over the place. This is Hesse right there, uh, which conveniently is located right in the center of the map. Uh, we, we were lucky in that respect. So that is something we did. And then, based on our survey, one of my friends and colleagues, uh, Jimmy Harden at Mississippi State University, and I decided to do a small project to check out what we viewed as an interesting site, Kirbet Sumeli. And here you can see this nice uh, reddish-brown soil, but up here it's lighter and it's grayer. This is the little site of Kirbet Sumeli, which we... Uh, have excavated from 2011 to 2017, uh, and, and then we have the COVID years, and actually the reason I'm going through town right now is to get our license to do our last season of excavation next summer, so I'm on my way to Jerusalem. It's, as I say, a very small excavation uh, of a you know, rather small site. So now what I'm going to do is, in a sense, shift and I'm going to talk about bigger picture items and, and the answers and, and make the historical context for the region based on the work of Petrie, Bliss, uh, the day when I was a student, our survey, and then this work we're doing at Sumail. So, what does the natural environment of the Hesse region allow as an agricultural foundation? What are we doing out here? Now, Petrie and Bliss and everybody up until at least the 1990s and many still today view the Hesse region as farmland. And the fact that until 30 years ago, nobody farmed it, they viewed that as because the Islamic conquest had so destroyed the environment that it was no longer capable of being farmed. Uh, I'll respectfully disagree. Uh, I, I have talked about this in other venues, and we don't need to revisit that other than to say, I think they're wrong. That gets ahead of the story. Okay, so here we are in, our, in the Hesse region, where it is farmed today but it is farmed with deep plows and wonderful modern cultivars that do much better than ancient cultivars. And what happens in this region, it's the soil. It's a luss of a specific type. And this is soil that, that, that originally comes from the Sahara <coughs> Desert. It's caught up in the wind, it comes over, and it deposits itself in Palestine. <coughs> this soil, if it rains, the first two drops of rain 
are sucked up and it just is absorbed into the soil. That third drop of rain on that area bounces off because the soil is fully saturated at the surface and it runs off and any time it rains you get flash floods. Okay, so while you may get 30 centimeters, 50 centimeters of rain a year, it all happens in one season and most of it runs off. And so you're never going to have, using traditional methods, enough rain to have good crops. Even today, when you're doing it with these really deep plows and everything and new cultivars, four years out of 10, you don't have a crop. But because we live in a modern society, you can farm this and be successful. In antiquity, no, you, you, you're not. So if you look at the soils map of this region, you'll see there's a light yellow here, but you see a dark yellow here. And this is the type of soil I'm talking about. Its name is the Ruhama Lus. And if you look at this, you will see that there is not, an, and I've looked at Turkish records from 1596 and 1871 on this, there is not a single site located in this deep, or this deep yellow because you can't make it work. You cannot do enough crop. Okay, now you find a couple at the edge of it. Okay, that's because it's in a different soil where you can farm. I did lie, the site of Hooge. That was built in 1820 by the mayor of Gaza who dug a 200 foot deep well. Can you have a small village hoisting up water 200 feet? Yes, you can, but it's not a very successful village. Nothing else. You can't farm out here. It does not work. So, Lord Allenby, 1917, the Battle of Beersheba and Gaza. He flew airplanes doing photography of the entire area. Tell El Hesse is right over here. This is 1917. You don't see any real agricultural land except in a few places right next to the wadi where the soil is different and you can pick up enough moisture. The RAF, 1945. This is the whole 10 by 10 area again. Now here you can start to see, up in the north especially, a few areas that are being farmed. But what's different? In the 1890s, you develop the ability to drill wells, pipe wells, and the pump, the kerosene and gasoline powered pump were invented and mastered. So that you could dig a 100 meter deep well and with your pump, you could pump the water up to the surface and you could have a farm. But if you look at the southern part here, you can see there's really very, very little area where they've done this. So my point is, historically, in a number of ways, I can prove that this area was not farmed. So this is how traditional farming was done up until the 1940s. You can see that you're not getting terribly deep. Uh, you're not going to preserve your water very well. This is not farmland. It's a pasturage. That's what it's been for the last 500 years. That's what it's been for the last 5,000 years. It's a pasturage. And you have to account for that when you're interpreting how the site Fellow Hesse uh, was used. Okay. Why is the site of Tel Hesse located where it is? Now that's what archaeologists have problems with sometimes. They don't know why it's precisely there. You know, it's at a crossroads. Great. Okay. It's at a harbor. Great. Okay, but many times you just can't answer that question. I think we can. Okay. Here is Tel Hesse. Here is this Lus. I have to switch sides. Um, the beautiful colored area is the rock sub, uh, substructure of Palestine. It goes down, it goes down below, and it eventually creates a continental shelf. The gray here is the Aeolian Lus and other things mixed together.
So what happens is you have water from the mountains is not absorbed because of the rocks and it goes rushing down the wadis and the minute it hits this lussy area and sandy area here, it does not continue across the surface. It goes down almost immediately, 40, 50 meters until it hits an impermeable layer. And then as a continental shelf, it goes across. So you have one wadi, two wadis, three wadis, four wadis, five wadis that all feed into Tel El Hesse and all of that water reaches here before it continues to the coast, but it reaches there, generally speaking, underground. Okay? So, that's what's happening. Now we're much closer. So here is Tel El Hesse, and here a few kilometers to the east is the site of Kirbet Junitra. And in the 1930s, a Bedouin sheikh decided he wanted a well. So he dug a well in the bottom of the wadi. He went down 10 to 15 meters. He hit water. He hit the best water in the area. Good on you, right? Okay. 30 years later, it's now Israel. There is a farmer here named Philippe. And the United Nations decides that they are going to give Israel some money to try to improve their agricultural techniques. And they needed some test plots. They chose his. For me as an archaeologist, I can't think of anything better. Somebody did the botany, somebody did the geology, somebody did everything. And it's there, totally ignored by all archaeologists. But it's there. As part of this project, they dug boreholes and wells all over this area because they knew that that well was good. They didn't hit water in almost every single one of them. But they did hit it in a number of them right around here. So what's going on? What's happened is the water is coming out of the mountains before the alluvium, so you know, millions of years ago, and it creates canyons. Not Grand Canyon, not big canyons, but 15, 10 meter deep canyons that shifted over time. And they all are headed, and this is one of them, there, there, there's probably other canyons, but this is one of them. And the water is working its way to the one spot, which is here, where you, where you break through. It's covered up now by soil, and so it's a slow process as the water moves to the east, or to the west. And it's down 15 meters there. At Tel El Hesse, it's down 50 centimeters, if at all. It's right near the surface. We're in the middle of a desert. There is a stream there. So what's happening? And Petrie and Bliss and some of the other explorers talk about this. The water comes to the surface half a kilometer east of Tel El Hesse in these wadis. So you have dry riverbeds to the east. Then it comes to the surface and for about one kilometer you have a stream. And then you have gone past the edge of the continental shelf. And so instead of an impermeable layer of rock, you have Nile sand. And so you get just past the site, and the water sinks down. So you have this one kilometer stretch of water. And so if you read the accounts, here is the stream that you have. Now it's a seasonal stream, because it's a, you have a rainy season in the winter. It rains until April, maybe, and the water flows until the summer, most years, and then it's dry. That's better than most places, and if you have a well, which they did, you, you, you will have a reasonable amount of water all year long. That's why this site is there, because in a desert, you have access to water. And here in 1917, this is part of Allenby's army, they have a pump, so they have gone to the well, because this is November, 
and they're pulling up all the water that these horses need to continue marching north towards Joppa and then to uh, Jerusalem. Okay, why was there a large city at Tel El Hesse during the early Bronze Age and at no other time? It's the same question we were just discussing. Here we are just downstream from Tel El Hesse. And you have a terrace deposit. This terrace deposit is full of what people call the Amorite pottery. It's early bronze three pottery. Mixed in with all this alluvium are these two types of water snails, land snails, but water. They only live in fresh water with a year long, constantly flowing stream. And they're found throughout this deposit. We excavated down there. We also found them. There has to be a stream. Well, the geologists working at Sorek Cave and geomorphologists working elsewhere in Israel have, have now done enough paleoclimatic research that we know that for a very short period in the early Bronze III, that was exceedingly wet. So what you have happening is, when our scientists of the UN were digging here, they said this functions like a cistern, but the cistern never gets more than half full because of the canyons. Well, for these few years in the EV3, there was a lot more rain coming out, the sister, the natural cisterns were filling up, and you had water flowing year round. Hence, in the middle of a desert, you have a flowing stream year round. It's a perfect site. And so you, the people who colonized the site saw that, they said it was perfect. This didn't start out as a one acre village. This started off as a 25-acre city. So somebody colonized it. They saw it was a perfect area, and they came out and built it. Little did they know it would soon dry out. OK, how long did this large city of Tel Hesse last during the EB3? OK, here is some of our pottery that we excavated compared with Petri's. If you're into pottery, you would know this is early Bronze three A pottery. That's 2800 to 2700 BC. In particular, notice this. This is the base of a jar of a vessel called a vat. Every one of the ones Petri showed here are vats. Okay, but you that that's that's a uh, think about that in a few minutes. Um, but it's EB three A, so we know that. We also did a lot of flotation, and we saved all these seeds from the excavation, and recently we ran them for radiocarbon dating. We have four phases of occupation. All the seeds are almost exactly the same date. They're, the entirety of the city cannot have been more than 30, 40 years. And then it dried out, and the city was abandoned. They built this beautiful city to do something and it was gone. So we have a date. It fits well with what the geologists are saying about the climate. What provided the economic basis to support EB3 Hesse? You have a passage. In the wadi bed, in the floodplain, you can actually grow wheat and barley because it's a different soil uh, and, and you can do it downstream from the site. So here is this big city. And we're excavating down here. Here it is more blown up. Here is the wall system. And the one place we dug interior to the wall is right down there. And in the first phase it was constructed, we have the city wall, we have a road, and we have an industrial area. And where it's orange or yellow, those are sources of heat. Here we have a fire pit. Here we have a hearth. 
Here we have a heated basin, and here we have an oven. They're doing something industrial. Now, these are not common. This is an early bronze three incised bone two. These are made from metapodials of cows. These are ankle sort of bones. There's one in each joint that are nice, generally speaking, straight. From cows. Cows need a lot of water, <coughs> and you only have that at this period, but that's just a sideline. So what you do is you slaughter the animal, you cut off both ends, you boil it in lye for about two hours, which softens the bone, and then you do all these really nice fancy incisions, and then as the bone dries out, it hardens again. You can actually put bitumen, which you're seeing right there, to make this turns white, that's black, get a nice design. This is a workshop at one small level to make bone tubes. And then what you do is, since you cut both ends off, you permanently seal one end, you have a temporary bottle stopper at the other end, and you store things like needles and pins and ochre and other colorants, things that are valuable that you need to carry. And these are found in, generally speaking, cemetery deposits around Palestine. Artistically, we've concluded they were probably mostly made at Tel El Hesse. So this is a product that you can actually create in a desert environment and sell for cash. Isn't that a wonderful idea? Okay, now but we go on to the important part. They're boiling lye to do this. That means there's lye at the site. Okay. There's a plant. This is a plant. The Arabs call it alkali. That's a word that's in English. That's alkali. That's how you make lye. So what you do is, when this plant is starting to, to seasonally turn brown, you harvest the leaves, you burn them at as low a temperature as you possibly can, then you boil them in water, and eventually you end up with hydroxides or lye. Okay? These vats, I think, are what you're boiling them in. And it's very interesting that many of the vats that we have are grossly corroded on the inside. And I've talked to some inorganic chemists. And they'd say, well, yes, that can certainly happen because the lye is acting with the clay and it's corroding. So much yay for the interpretation. Okay, <laughs> What are you doing with the lye? You're making soap, most likely. And so you have the lye, so you're slaughtering some cows, you're slaughtering some sheep, and the extra parts, the offal, spelled O-F-F, -F, not A-W, the offal, you then throw into the boiling lye, and you get soap. Well, what do you do with the soap? Well, if you have a hell of a lot of sheep, you are shearing the sheep, Maybe you're eating some of it, but you're shearing the sheep and you're making cloth. And yes, we have loom weights, we have picks. So that's how we think the economy, the majority of the economy of this site worked. That's most of the site. And our industrial areas at the far east, we have prevailing westerlies. So the area that's gonna be really stinky is blown off the site. To the east, where Bliss dug, he dug here, and he was in the good area of town, where the elites lived. And that is where he found the copper hoard. It is arsenic bronze, which is naturally occurring. Um, even today, this is the best collection of early Bronze Age copper hoard found. And, as Felicity just much of it is sitting out there on display. There are a couple of pieces from it that are in the Rockefeller Museum, not on display, 
uh, in Jerusalem. And so we know there are elites for these few years the site is occupied. You know, we don't know precisely what they're doing, but these are some incredible weapons for the time. The assumption is these vessels, the, the copper or arsenic bronze, probably comes from Thainan in Jordan. It's conceivable it comes from Timna down there a lot. Other sources are possible, and that, that there is now a fellow at Tel Aviv University who's working at the Timna site. He also worked at the other site in Jordan, and he's trying to sort out where all the copper. And it's not, it's not a great deal of copper, but where it comes from. <clears throat> What's with all the ash? I haven't talked about this. Okay, so we're digging here, and this is where we found the industrial area. But if you go outside the wall, all along here, you have a deposit that's up to two meters deep of solid ash. Just solid ash. Now just think, this is 5,000 years after it was deposited. Ash tends to want to blow away if you have winds. There's this huge deposit that erosion has been working on. It's still sitting there. Okay, that's interesting. We don't know what it is. But in digging here in a tower inside the wall, what we found was that on the inside, the brick had been heated very much. When we dug it, we thought, eh, there was a fire the roof collapsed. Well, we never found evidence of the roof collapsing. We found evidence of heating, not the roof collapsing. And we looked around, and we looked around, and we looked around, and we didn't find really any parallels to this. And then somebody said, well, maybe we should read Bliss again. Bliss, when he's excavating here, City One, same exact period, in corridors inside a tower in the city wall. He says, you know, it's really weird. On the inside, it's heated brick, and there's no evidence of a roof collapse. I've talked to furnace experts. If this, if you have air coming in from the bottom and going up, you know, eight meters of a city wall, you'll get to temperatures a thousand degrees centigrade. We have no evidence of faience, we have no evidence of metallurgy, we have no evidence of pottery production or anything. We just have all this ash and two places where you can get a heck of a lot of heat to do something. We have no idea. Well, that's cool. When Bliss was excavating and Petrie saw it in the late Bronze Age, there is this layer of ash. It's between three and 17 feet thick. Feet thick! Here it is going across the site. We trimmed up a bulk to see part of these nice layers. It's deposited over a not a very long period of time. It's, it's probably the start of the 13th century BC. It's on the top of a site with prevailing westerlies. It's 17 feet thick. How much ash blew away? <laughs> I mean, it, it's just, we don't have a clue, okay? Bliss left us a clue. Digging in city two, he found something that was done, that he put on his plan in a different ink. It is, a blast furnace, as he called it. It's a furnace. He didn't know where to put it in, and he misphased it because it was probably dug down in a pit. And it is right under the ash layer. What do we have here? Here is his drawing of the furnace, and I was deeply suspicious that he was influenced by uh, blast furnaces of the 19th century. Felicity found this original drawing without the help of a blast furnace expert. This is what he dug with and you know ashes, and then it says slag. Well, they had a person in the 19th century analyze the slag. And he said, well, yes, there is copper, there's iron in it. But all that is is 
LUS that's been heated. And the basic elements, some of the basic elements of clay are aluminum, copper, iron. What we have here, the slag is slaking off the mud brick of the smokestack, shall we say, coming down as, as, the, as it was abandoned. So we have two massive ash deposits, each associated with furnaces that can get up to 1,000 degrees. If you're into what this looked like, this looks a lot like a bottle kiln of the 19th century, tall, big smokestack going up like that. We have no idea because, again, Bliss said, there's no faience, there's no pottery, there's no metallurgy. What's going on? We don't know. But we have it happening twice, 1,500 years apart. So I'm willing to go out on my limb, and here I'm out on my limb, and I'll say, there's something out there that is growing. And what they're doing is they're harvesting it, they're over-harvesting it, they're utilizing it to do something, and then they run out of it. And that's why this, this phase lasted for only maybe 20 years. Okay. What was Tallahassee in the late Bronze Age, and for that matter, the Persian period? Okay. This is his city three. He found a number of artifacts that were Egyptian, including a Telamarna period tablet. So we know that we're dating to the late 14th century BC, and the ash layer is right on top of this. So you got 17 feet of ash. It's not as if they're mixing up where this tablet was found. So a bunch of Egy Egyptological artifacts here, and a Narna period tablet that's going back to Egypt for Akhenaten or King Tut, something like that. The tablet is from Lachish, and the um, king of Lachish is describing his relations with other kings. Um, I think what we have is that in, in, a, in an imperial world, the overlords from Egypt have observation points. And this is known from Egyptian records, from Assyrian records, from Ottoman records, you have people watching. And we think that that's what's happening at Hesse. You have some Egyptians watching. You have an Egyptian outpost. Then you have the ash, and then you have the next phase. City four is a building that's built in an Egyptian style. These get called Egyptian governor's residences. Here's the first one that was done. Bliss didn't know that. It was destroyed probably about the year 1200. And one of the things that Bliss says about this is it, in his description, something's off in this destruction. And what's off is that it was salvaged. So there were things in there that were valuable in this Egyptian-style governor's residency. Again, I think of people watching. I think you have the military watching everything that's going on, and controlling the grasslands around what we have, then this is destroyed. When Petrie was there, he found a building he called the Pilaster Building. Because you have these pilasters on the surface of the walls in the tunnels that he dug to get to them. Okay, cool. But they're upside down. This is upside down and it's reused as a door jam or a door lock. This is a graffiti that's on one of them. This is how it was oriented. It was oriented upside down. So I think my interpretation that's published in PEQ, I might add, says they salvaged the old building, and they reused this ornamental architecture you know, in the new building. 
So here is Blessed City 4 of the 13th century. Here is Petrie's Pilaster building of the 12th century. On this site where you have some water overlooking this area, observing, observing. We have a number of sites in red that you can sort of attribute to the observing function. But I think there's, I think we're some small military garrison, I think, but they're doing more. And as I keep saying, they're probably guarding the pasturage so that it's my sheep that use the pasturage, not your sheep. Okay, the Egyptians are an empire, an imperial provisioning empire, and this is terminology from the Ottoman period that uh, used to describe, especially in the 16th century. So how does this work? Originally, people 50 years ago thought, okay, they're growing grain out here, they're shipping it to the grain storage facilities along the coast. And when the Egyptian army under the Pharaoh is marching north to smite somebody, you have to eat. And, and you have these warehouses and you take the grain out of the warehouse. Well, but we know they're not growing grain. We know we're a pasture is growing sheep. Okay, you look at what's going on in the 16th century, the Ottoman period. How does this work? Okay, you're growing sheep down here. Pharaoh says, on May 1st, the army is going to be in Gaza. They're going to be hungry. I want you to herd your sheep, some of your sheep, and have them in Gaza on May 1st. They're going to be in Ashkelon on May 3rd. I want you guys to send your sheep to Ashkelon on May 3rd. I want you guys to send your sheep so that the army has something to eat. And that's exactly how the Ottomans fed their army, is instead of slaughtering the meat and freezing it, as we would, and sending it, you're walking the lambs, the sheep, the goats, to their slaughter to be eaten by the army. So I think that's what's going on. And there's our sheep and goats again. So that's what I think is going on. And then in the Pilaster building, it's destroyed in a major destruction. This vessel is sitting, the only one of the very few vessels sitting smashed on the floors. It's incredibly distinctive. Felicity could find it and show it to you. Uh, in the old buildings, it was on display, but you would never have found it in that display. Um, but it dates to about 1140, and that's how you uh, assign the end uh, of this occupation. And then the site's abandoned for about 100 years. The same thing was going on during the Persian period, I think. I'm not going to show that, but the Persians control this area, and they have a, this is a border against Egypt. And so it's the same dynamics going on, and, and it's, a, a, it's a storage facility and an observation point. Okay, here we are in the Iron Age. It's a little different here, but it's a similar refrain. Here's Hesse, here's Umwakis, and right near Umwakis is Kirbut Sumeli, where my buddy and I are digging. This terribly complicated plan of what we found can be simplified in words. About the year 1000, somebody decided to build a governmental structure here. They put in about this deep of walls around the edges and filled them up with soil to create a platform. And here's the foundation for the city wall on the outside. So you're building a platform. Here you have the building. Here you have stuff going on outside the building, shall we say in courtyards. Here we have a cult room, and this is part of the gate complex, and this is what we hope to figure out this next summer. When we've been digging this site, we keep finding these. These are called bullae. It's about the size of your thumbnail. These are made out of clay. The Assyrians, 
wrote on cuneiform tablets. In this period, you're writing on vellum. You're writing on uh, you know, things like that. You write, you write, you write, and you're going to send it. You fold it up, fold it up, fold it up. You take string. You tie it up. You put a little piece of clay under it. You put a little piece of clay over it. You push it, and you put your stamp seal on it. And that way you know that nobody's mucked up. You know. Okay, those are never preserved because they're made out of clay. It rains, you get wet, it's gone. This building was burned. This is fired pottery now. And so that's why we're finding them. And so I am assuming that at least one of the functions of this is as a postal station on the road where the trunk road from Hebron comes in and hits the Via Maris. And that's what this site is. Okay, that's sort of cool. In the cult room, here is some of the pottery. This actually goes on that. It's this beautiful cult stand. This is not a Philistine cult stand. This is a cult stand that you would get in the hill country. The vast majority of the pottery we get is from the hill country. Everybody else says we're in Philistia. That's cool to say that, but you should have some Philistine pottery. And we really don't. We have a little at this site. And in the cult room, here we have, above the altar, sticking into the wall, is this lion's head. Here's its eyes, here's its snout, that would be part of the religion. I am not going to speculate more. I'm not, I'm not terribly much into religion. But I will remind you that Haile Selassie was called the Lion of Judah uh, you know, in, in passing. OK. Um, now we're at Hesse, exactly contemporary. Three kilometers to the east, you're on top of the site. And Bliss found these really weird structures that he didn't have a clue what they were. If you put them together, and, and how they must have looked by modern parallels, you get something like that. And here, you see them from other sites that are much better, <coughs> Megiddo and Hatzor. These got called stables in years gone by. There's now an argument. Could these be storage, or storage structures? Some people say yes. The terminology has become tripartite pillared buildings. Because you have the three aisles, fine. I think in our area, there are certainly stables at some point. They could be storage. Here is a 10th century map showing where these are found and where they might be found. And what you see is that they're going around the border, probably the border region, of the entity that's probably on the interior. You probably don't have the groups on the exterior building exactly the same structure in other regions. So whoever's controlling this area is this region. Uh, some people would want to call this Israel. Some people would want to call it Judah. Some people might want to call it Canaan. I don't care. I call it the People's Democratic Republic of Hebron. But that's <laughs> just me. And this building was destroyed about 925 BC, which is exactly the same time Sumeria was destroyed. Both had destructions at 925. Almost immediately, a fort is built. This is what Bliss found in the fort. This is what we found in the fort. A 42 foot wide wall at the bottom, and this is a site smaller than this building. A slope, another big wall. They put in five meters, 18 feet of fill. And on top of that, they built a public structure. This is a fort. And we're pretty sure that this, the top of this had a fire installation. And it's part of a border fortification of Judah in the 9th and 8th centuries uh, BC. And you have a number of other sites that look similar. Here we are, right here, and we're all right around Lachish. We are protecting the grasslands. So this would be the border. It was destroyed by the Assyrians. 
Okay, so as I finish here, any guesses as to the biblical name of Telephesi? I only provide guesses to that when Felicity put my arm behind my back and twisted. This is not something that I do. But, Shishak, the pharaoh of Egypt, recorded, and there's controversy here, he recorded sites that he supposedly took. One of those sites is a site called the Enclosure of Gad. Gad not being the biblical tribe, but Gad being the god of good fortune. Okay? And this would be 925 is the traditional date for this destruction event. If you look at the biblical account and you look at Joshua 15, which are the tribal allocations, this is what would be viewed as District 3, which is the Lachish district. I think you read the uh, list from west to east, and there's right there, there's a site called Migdal Gad, the fort of good fortune. Well, what did the archaeology just show us? It showed us that there was an enclosure with the stables in it, the enclosure of Gad. It was destroyed, and then they built a fort on top of it. They raised it 20 feet. You can see much better. You can communicate much better. And, it, and so, therefore, I would argue that it became Migdogad, and that would be its biblical name. While people originally came there to call it Lachish, or maybe Ajlan, others have said Gath, others have said Ziklag, others have said Gimzo. I, I would argue if you're going to put a name to it, you're putting Migdogad. Uh, Last slide. And this is, I want to thank PEF for these years of friendship and help, both to me and our project. I have aged dramatically <laughs> during the last 50 years. This is me in 1971, after a very fun mud fight. That's a whole different story. This is me, 19, or 2014. Uh, I hope this year to be able to update that picture by 10 years. Uh, but this has all been facilitated by the PEF with them helping us and us trying to help them understand uh, what the archaeological record was that Petri and Bliss excavated all those many years ago. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff, for that amazing kind of... Uh, scope through time. Um, we're running a little bit late, so a few questions, just a few. Anyone got any things that are burning in their mind after that presentation? I will start off then. Okay. Uh, I want to know, is there any data on the ash itself, the fuel? The, the, okay, we are, one of the things I'm asking for this year is for us to get permission to go back and resample the ash. Uh -huh. We sampled the ash 50 years ago, and we loaded the ash, which is one type of analysis, and we found that a lot of it is wheat and barley that's preserved in there, some olive. Okay. What we need to figure out is what the biomass is, mm -hmm. so we're going to do a different type of analysis this time. We're also going to do phytolith analysis, which is the little silicon that grows in plants that are distinctive to each plant, and one of the things I hope to find maybe not in great quantity, is a little bit of salsola Okay. But you see, it's really interesting. To make lye, you don't want to get much above boiling, or it destroys it. But then all this ash and these furnaces get you to 1,000 degrees centigrade. So I, we have no idea. And, and so we're going to, you know, that's what we want to look at. And we'll see as far as we can go, but I think that that is a question that will probably not be answered until maybe my student, their students, someday go back and, and, and you know investigate that aspect. Amazing, fascinating. Yeah, really, really interesting. It's always nice to have something that you don't know yet. <laughs> There's so I, I skipped over most of what we I don't know. know. Okay. <laughs> I left you the big question. Yes, John. A lot of bats, a lot of soap, and they're particularly good. Well, they're always a, a big export of soap. Well, how many sheep are being processed? 
You use a lot of soap to clean the lanolin and dirt out of the fleece. And we know this because exactly contemporaneously in Mesopotamia, you have accounts of making soap and washing the fleece to uh, create the, you know, the wool uh, for clothing. But that is a very good question. We, we just don't know the scale or the scope because we dug, as it turns out, the industrial complex. And that is not where you would have probably actually been doing the washing or the weaving or the making of, uh, making of uh, the, the material, yes. yeah, making the cloth. Any other questions there? I was going to say, don't you need urine as well to process wool? You, you, urine is, is, is a very good thing in this particular case. That tends more often to be used to make it whiter. They, they could easily have been doing this, uh, but at this point, we have no evidence of that. But you can certainly make the soap and clean it. Uh, but, but in terms of uh, whitening it or dyeing it, uh, th that's a different issue which I have not looked into and we found no evidence. Now, I was just wondering, <clears throat> cattle wouldn't seem to be the normal type of animals that you find in a pair of sheep and camel and things. Do you think that it, those bones could have been from other animals rather than cattle? Because they'd be pasture land, good quality, all year round. And as your picture shows, you know, the quality mm -hmm. of what the sheep can eat, you know, they can survive on very rough and poor quality. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, I, I, I agree with you, but this is happening during this 30 or 40 years where you have the stream flowing by all the time. Mm -hmm. So you have all the water that you want for these years. Mm -hmm. So the camel or the camels, the cattle have whatever they have to drink. And there's no doubt about what the animal is, mm -hmm. the faunal people say. But if you go to other periods at the site, you don't have more than a very small quantity uh, of cattle. Mm -hmm. So it's only in the early Bronze Age you have maybe 10% to 15% cattle. So it's an exception, and again, it correlates when you would have had a year-round uh, stream. Fascinating stuff. Yeah. Any more questions? In that case, I'm going to ask all of you to give Jeff a round of applause for our <laughs> Bar, I'd just like to ask our president, Jonathan Tuck, to give a, a few words of thanks. Oh, okay. Jonathan and Jeff know each other. Know each other for 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> it is about, yeah. Okay. Jeff, that was a great lecture, really great. I like your interpretation of the, your um, uh, identification better than any of the others I've heard, so that I think is really good. Um, you know, I've never been to Hesse. I've been past it. I've never been to Hesse. My experience of Hesse, uh, and actually of Jeff at the same time, was when I first started going to the annual meetings in the American School of Oriental Research back in the, what, 1990s? 80s? 80s? Eight, well, 70s, seven, yes. Okay. <laughs> and from the very first meeting I went to, which I think was in Chicago, I can't quite remember, and then every year I consistently crashed the Hesse reception. Mm -hmm. Not just me, a couple of friends as well. And I remember Jeff because he actually he was so kind, he never ejected me once. <laughs> <laughs> how I got to know Jeff, how I got to know about Hesse, I think you've done a brilliant job. Uh, I didn't realize we both we share a governor's residency. Sorry, I've done it tell you know, and Jordan for many years. And the plan of my residency is very similar to yours. Um, and the same same sort of period. Um, I'm very, very interested in your early Bronze Age, which is the period after mine has actually gone into decline at the end of EB3, the kickoff in EB3, which is terrific, um, with that fascinating industry. Jeff has been superb. Put, it, put your hands together. Let's go. <laughs> I'm a dog person. I understand. <laughs> He's clapping. He's clapping. Let's have a change. Very good. Okay. Thank you.